because uh, there's nominees and a bill on the agenda for the first time, our side would like them to be held over uh, for the normal week under the committee rules. I'm pleased that uh, S 998 uh, Driving for Opportunity Act is on the committee's markup agenda. I'm a co-sponsor of this bipartisan bill and look forward to its consideration and advancement next week. Before we discuss the judicial nominees, I want to talk about the draft report published by the White House Commission on Packing the Supreme Court and other so-called reforms. It's good to see that the Commission's draft acknowledges the historic risks that come with this attack on the judicial independence. Technically, the Commission didn't take a position on packing the court. The report says, quote, the commissioners are divided on whether court expansion would be wise, end of quote. Uh, but the report also acknowledged many Americans would see court packing as, uh, in, their, in the words of the report, as partisan maneuver. Of course, that's very obvious. As President Biden noted in 2019, packing the Supreme Court would mean it would, quote, lose any credibility the court has at all, end of quote the dark money groups and their allies in the Senate pushing for so-called reform. No, it's a radical proposal. It will damage the credibility and standing of the Supreme Court. So I'm glad to see that people recognize the dangerous game that these leftist activists are playing in attacking the court. I'm interested to see if the commission's final report reflects these simply simple uh, uh, truths. I plan to vote no on both of the judicial nominees today. I have a statement that I'll place on the record explaining my reason on those votes. <clears throat> I introduced the False Claims Act of uh, 2021 over three months ago. Since that time, my staff has had meetings with stakeholders as well as reach out and talk with every member on the Republican side. We did more than just talk, we listened. The main concern expressed by most of my colleagues was the potential of overreach and unintended consequences. To address my concerns, colleagues' concerns, we developed a manager's amendment to further refine and clarify the intent of the bill. And now in an effort to be transparent as possible, Chair Durbin and I agreed to postpone this vote in order to give ample time for the public and everyone on the committee to review the language. I'd like to thank all of our co-sponsors and my colleagues for working with me to finalize that. Mr. Chairman, I want to take just a little bit of time to expand on what I just said about the bill we held over. And it's for all of my colleagues that maybe have come to the Senate in the last 20 years don't know about the benefits of the False Claims Act. It's brought in $67 billion of uh, uh, fraudulently taken money from the taxpayers. The, it, it, this whole approach to key TAM started in the, in the Civil War, Lincoln, and it worked pretty good until 1942 when it was gutted by the Congress of the United States because of the war efforts. Everybody thought that if you were going to sue these defense contractors, we might not win World War II. So it was that way for the next 50 years. And then in 1986, we finally come forth with the key TAM provisions that makes this law possible to bring back $67 billion of fraudulently taken money. Now understand that to get this bill passed in the first place, we were fighting the defense contractors for a whole year. Get the bill out of committee, I think with a fairly wide margin. By the way, I need to compliment Senator Lay because over the last 20 years, he and I have sponsored bills to override court decisions that weaken the original intent of the bill. And so I thank Senator Lay for doing that. But remember that we were, it was originally the defense contractors. They fought this idea over and over and over again. And when I finally got the bill out of committee, then they go to this senator to put a hold on. You go to that senator to explain what the bill's supposed to accomplish, and they said, 
uh, it sounds like a good piece of legislation. And then they get another person to put a hold on the bill, and another person, and another person. Finally, they went to Jesse Helms, because with Jesse Helms, they'd be able to kill this bill forever. I talked to Jesse Helms about it. I, can you lift your hold? He said, I read the bill. It makes common sense to me. We got the bill passed and it was signed by the President of the United States. So what are we still talking about today? You get court, court decisions that gut the bill because they interpret something different than what we intended, or the Department of Justice is doing something. So Leahy and I come along and we try to correct what the courts are doing a disjustice to the original purpose of the False Claims Act. And that original purpose has ended up with $67 billion of fraudulently taken money. So uh, when we're trying to correct some misinterpretation by the court, it should be a non-controversial thing based on the fact that this legislation works. So I hope next week, when we're working on this bill, you'll think about the history of it and, and what it is. Now, the defense contractors have given up after 20 years. Various pieces of amendments they tried to get adopted on the floor of the Senate. They couldn't get it adopted. Now there's other interests that think, boy, we don't want to put up with this False Claims Act. So they're giving Leahy and me problems on getting these corrections passed. I hope you think about that for the next seven days. I will. I hope everyone will join me in thinking about it, and we know you're... And thinking hard about it. Thinking hard. Bravo, Senator Grassley. Yeah. <laughs> well... I agree with you, Charlie. <laughs> Thank, you, Thank you, Senator. Thank you. I knew as soon as you said something nice about Senator Leahy, he would agree with you. And uh, before we go to the legislation,